We hope that you enjoy this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com. Well, take out your Bibles and your sermon outlines, and let's pray before we jump in this morning. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today to open your word and to study it. We want our lives to be changed. When we walk out of here, we don't want to be the same as when we came in, and that's our prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. A woman walked into the kitchen to find her husband stalking around with a fly swatter. She goes, what are you doing hunting flies, he said. Oh, did you kill any, she asked. The man said, yep, two males and three females. The wife looked at her husband and she goes, you can't tell which fly is a male and a female. Give me a break. And he goes, yes, I actually can. She goes, how? And the husband smiles and he goes, honey, it was obvious. Three were on the beer can, two were on the phone. Easy way to tell which fly is which, right? (laughs) Happy Father's Day to all our fathers. Sean did a good job of saying that already, but uh, how many of you ever got great advice from your dad? Anybody here ever get great advice from your dad? Only about six of you. Well, that's just because you don't remember. Let me refresh your memory, okay? Let's see if you can finish these statements that dad might have said. Here's one of them. What? Do you think money just grows? Oh, look at you. You remembered one of your dad advice. Let's keep going. Another one. What do you think I'm made of? Money. Money. Yeah, money's a big topic with dads, in case you haven't noticed. Here's another one. I'm not sleeping. I'm just... You had the same dad I did. (laughs) Here's another one. Don't talk back to your... Mother, yeah. How many have heard that one before? Oh, yeah. You talk back to mom, you're in trouble. Here's a good dad advice. A little hard work, never. Mm -hmm. They sure don't make them. Don't leave that door open. What were you? Stop crying or I'll. Kind of scary, huh? (laughs) Young lady, please tell me you are not going out. Dress like that, looking like that. Here's one. Sure, I'd like to meet the boy. I'll be in the back room cleaning my... <laughs> and probably the number one re- request we get from our dad is, whatever you do, don't tell your mm-hmm. I think all our dads went to the same dad school. How about you? <laughs> well, today we're honoring our dads because they're so special in our life. Men, dads, you inspire us to believe. Let me show you why I say that. I'd like for you to read Mark eleven twenty four out loud together with me. It's up on the screen. Let's read it nice and loud together. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That's an incredible verse. When you ask God for something, believe in your heart that you already have it as a done deal, and it says there, it will be yours. What? That can't be right. That's an outrageous promise. Well, how many of you think we should probably believe the whole book of the Bible, not just pick and choose? Anybody believe that? Yeah, so just in case you think that was a one-time verse that God put in the Bible, let's read it in Matthew 21, 22. Let's read this out loud, even twice as loud as last time. Read it with me. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Wow. Anybody think you might have not been believing enough lately? We have to believe. This, See, believe is opposite of another word, and that's doubt. We say, well, I don't know. I have my doubts. But look at what James, the stepbrother Jesus, wrote in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. This is straight talk. Let's read this out loud together. This is a little longer. How many can do it? Let's read it real loud. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Oh, snap. That's the Gwen Stefani verse of the Bible right now. She, she had a, a group called No Doubt. <laughs> this is the No Doubt verse of the Bible. If you doubt and don't believe, you get nothing. So how many want to make sure you believe? All right. Well, in your outline, if I will just believe, fill this in under number one, I will move the heart of Jesus. I will move the heart of Jesus. 
If you want to turn to Mark chapter 5, we're going to walk through a story about a dad. Mark chapter 5. But the verses will be up on the screen. Now you notice I have my Bible with you. I want to encourage you to bring your Bible with you. Because you never know when the screen might be wrong. Never know when the outline might be wrong. Never know when I might be wrong. How many agree you have to check everything nowadays? This is probably the only thing you can trust right now. <laughs> Mark 5, beginning in verse 21, it says this, When Jesus had again crossed even over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. He pleaded earnestly. My guess is this dad was on his knees. It says he fell at Jesus' feet. He believed Jesus could heal his daughter. He had faith for a miracle. I don't know about you, but watching the news lately, I think we all better be on our knees for our children. Anybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. There is an attack on our kids. In fact, there is something so dramatic, so demonic going on that they're saying, you know those kids that you have, that you birthed, that you, you've raised? They're not yours. They belong to the government. Woo! Yeah, baloney, right? Phony, right? It's an attack on our kids. What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You do what this dad did. You fall on your knees and you pray for them. You could be doing the absolute most you could do for your children if you will pray for them. And that's what Jairus did. He falls on his knees. It was a great decision because it says Jesus went with him. Him falling on his knees communicated something to Jesus, and that was, I believe you can do this, Jesus. And it moved the heart of Jesus. When you believe, you move the heart of Jesus. And if you believe, I will, number two, activate God's power to flow from Jesus. This is a Jesus story today. Have you noticed that? So continue on. In verse 24, it says, A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. A random lady in the crowd, we don't even know her name. She had a terrible health condition. She was bleeding for 12 years years. Most likely that means she had a constant cycle for 12 years, had cramps for 12 years. And here's the thing in Jewish culture, if you were in your cycle, you couldn't attend the synagogue. So this lady couldn't go to church for 12 years. And then she's out of money. She'd been to the top doctors. Instead of getting better, she got worse. Anybody in the same boat as this lady today? It's getting worse instead of better. You've tried everything, every way. Maybe it's not a health problem. Maybe it's some other crisis, and you're suffering, and you're out of money, and it adds insult to injury. Instead of getting better, it's getting worse. She wanted to be made whole. All of us want to be made whole, and only Jesus can do it. I bet if I were asked for a showing of hands, there's probably, be, let's ask for a showing of hands. How many think that Jesus rescued you from a much worse life at some point in your life. Wow, look at all the hands. <laughs> You're like, oh, where would I be right now if it wasn't for Jesus? Don't ever forget that. That's a beautiful story. It's the story of your life, how Jesus rescued you and changed your life. Here's the point. When we study these stories in the Bible, we get our faith built that Jesus can do something incredible for us. He can give us the victory over things that are causing us problems. Because on the back of your outline, Fill this in. If I would just believe, it will display my faith in Jesus. Oh, this is good. Now, stay with me now. We've got a plot twist coming up here. Verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? 
You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. What a beautiful story. What in the world is going on here, though? There's five verses <laughs> in the Bible dedicated to Jesus trying to find out who touched him. Why would Jesus go all the trouble to find this lady and say, who was it that touched me? I love it. Look at that phrase there. Your faith has healed you. Circle that. Your faith has healed you. It was her belief that Jesus could heal her. She said, if I'll just touch the garment... And Jesus wanted to make sure this lady knew. It wasn't the fact that you touched my garment. My garment's not some special uh, robe that has magical powers to heal people. He was like, who touched me? I know power went out, but I want to make sure she understands your faith is what healed you. And there's another. If we go back to our story with our dad now, we're going to see something. Number four, it will release my fears because of Jesus. Verse 35 it says, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, you might be tempted when you're reading along this story in the Bible, you might be tempted to think, well, the story of the healed woman is over, and now, now we're back to the main story. But as you read the Bible, you know what I love is there's, there's not any filler in here. You start to realize that there's little nuances, just a little detail where you go, oh, wait, that's important. And that's what's happening here. Who was standing by Jesus while this was all going on, the who touched me part? Who's standing there? Our dad, Jairus, he's watching all this. He convinces Jesus to go see his dying little daughter. They're walking along. A whole crowd is pressed against him. The woman touches Jesus' cloak and gets healed. And Jesus says, who touched me? She fesses up. And then Jesus said, it's your faith is what has healed you. And now this poor dad, they're standing there, and some family members come up, and they go, it's over. Your daughter's died. What would you want to say to Jesus right then if you were Jairus? I don't know. If my daughter, I just found out she died, and we were standing here doing this who touched me thing and the ladies being healed and all that, I think I'd be tempted to say, hey, Jesus, if we hadn't spent so much time with you figuring out who touched you, maybe we could have got to my daughter in time, but instead, no, we're saying, who touched me? And there's people all around. Why do we have to do that, Jesus? We lost valuable time. Here's what I tell you. Sometime one person's mistake is another person's miracle. Don't ever forget that. Sometimes somebody's distraction is exactly going to be your, great, your breakthrough. It reminds me of this pastor. He, uh, he was walking through the neighborhood here in Colorado Springs one day, and he saw this cat up in a tree, and the cat was stuck up there because he was afraid to come down. He climbed up so high, and then he couldn't get down. So the pastor tried coaxing the kitty. He went in his house, got some milk, and brought it up, tried to hold it up to the kitty, and the little kitten just wouldn't come down. The tree was not sturdy enough for him to climb up, and so he's sitting there looking at it, and all of a sudden he goes, I got an idea. He gets a rope out of the trunk of his car. He ties it to the branch of the tree, ties the under end, end to the bumper of his car. He goes, if I can just pull that tree down a little with my car real slowly, I can reach up and get the cat. How many think this is a wonderful idea? It was a wonderful idea. So he does it. He pulls the car. He's got the window down. He's pulling the car forward and forward. And here comes the tree. He's bending the tree down. He's like, a little more, and I can get the cat. The cat is down almost low enough. And right about then, the rope broke. Boing! Shoots the cat over the fence into another neighborhood somewhere around another house. He's like, oh, no. So he gets in his car. He's driving through the neighborhood. He's looking for this little cat all through the neighborhood. He's peering in the yards. He gets out every once in a while, looks around. 
he finally gives up. He's like, I don't know where the cat went. Lord, forgive me for shooting the cat into the air. Help the cat be found. Amen. Well, later that week, he's walking in the grocery store. He sees a lady in the church. You know how pastors, you run into people in your church. So he sees this lady, and she's got a cart. She's pushing it along, and he looks down the cart. He sees cat food. Now, this lady had always talked about, I love dogs, but I hate cats. He said, why are you, uh, why do you have cat food? Don't you hate cats? I remember you talking about that. And she goes, Pastor, you won't believe this. My little girl has been begging me for a cat. And she's just constantly bugging me for a cat. And I told her, no, we have dogs. We're not going to have a cat. I hate cats. And she goes, she kept bugging me. And I finally said, you know what? If, you, if God wants you to have a cat, he'll just put one into your arms. Just pray to the Lord, and he'll put one into your arms. And she goes, Pastor, my little daughter went out in our backyard. She kneeled down. She goes, Lord, please send me a cat. And here comes one through the sky. Paws outstretched. Ah! Right into my daughter's lap. That's how you know. How many agree a mistake can be somebody's answer to prayer? <laughs> but if you haven't circled anything in your outline yet, you just have to circle this. For some of you, this will be the whole sermon in a nutshell. I have a visual of Jesus standing there talking to Jairus with those steely eyes. They said, the child is dead. And Jesus, what did Jesus say? Don't be afraid, just believe. I don't know what's happening to you right now. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Maybe you've had a business loss. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you don't have enough money to pay the bills this month. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Because if I will just believe, number five, I have to focus on how Jesus looks at my crisis. Well, Jesus is not going to take the lightweights in now. He gets to the house. He picks Peter, James, and John. Those are his three closest disciples. Verse 37, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. That was a historical way the Jews mourned to death. He went in and he said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. Hmm. How do you think Jairus is feeling right about now? These are his closest friends and family. He goes and gets Jesus. Jesus walks up, says the strangest thing. Oh, no, she's not dead. She's just taking a nap. How incredibly embarrassing. Right in that moment, our dad, Jairus, he was being tested in his commitment, in his faith. The whole crowd's laughing at Jesus. Will he hang in there? Would you? Listen, if they laugh at Jesus, they're going to laugh at you. Don't you let that bother you. People may laugh at you. Oh, you're one of those Christians. Oh, you think that, you know, God do is, does everything. They'll ridicule you. They'll misunderstand you. They'll slander you. We live in a culture now that's getting more and more antagonistic towards people of faith. Don't pay attention to them. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That reminds me of the blonde. Uh, I tell a blonde joke occasionally in a sermon. I hope this doesn't offend any of you blondes. Please know it's for Sandy. She really loves these. If it doesn't go over, I'll never tell another one again, okay? But this blonde, she goes to the doctor. She goes, every time I drink a cup of coffee, I get a terrible pain in my eye. The doctor said, well, I need to check this out. So he makes her a fresh cup of coffee, and he just hands it to her and everything. And so the blonde takes a sip of the coffee, and she goes, ah, my eye, it hurts so bad. The doctor said, I think I know what your problem is. The blonde goes, what is it? Can you fix it? And he goes, yeah, just take the spoon out before you take it through. <laughs> Was that worth it? No? Okay. Send me an email. All right, so actually send, send an email to Pastor Sean. <laughs> He's the complaint department. I just started that one yesterday. <laughs> Jesus looks at any crisis you have like the doctor looked at the blonde's problem. It's not too difficult for Jesus. How many agree? It's nothing is too difficult for him. Jesus was telling the crowd, the dad and the disciples, and all of us, if you think something's dead, 
I can raise it back to life. It's just dormant. It's just sleeping. You think it's impossible? Jesus says, that's no big deal. I can do that. Whatever you think can, have, can never happen, Jesus says, let's do it now. People might be saying, the well, reason I'm excited about this is people might be saying, well, ABC Church's best days are behind now. They got that lunatic pastor in there now. They, they may say, I don't think anything's ever going to happen. There's so many other churches along the street next to ABC. Excuse me, I think the best is yet to come. How about you? Jesus can take whatever it appears. He could say, no, it looks a little dormant. It looks a little sleep. It looks like it might be taking a nap. And he can put new life into it and new hope into it. Is there anybody excited about ABC Community Church this morning? I am too. Last one. If I will just believe it, I will receive my breakthrough from Jesus. Jairus hangs in there. Dads, thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for hanging in there. We appreciate you so much. There's many times when it's got to feel like, ugh, I just work and I work and I work and I do this and I do that and I do this. Trying to provide and protect your family. Jairus does the same. He brushes off the laughter. Verse 40. After he put them all out, talking about Jesus, he took the child's father and mother and the three disciples, it says the disciples, who were with him. And they went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Jairus believed, Jesus answered, and his daughter was healed. I don't know what situation you're facing right now, what you're worried about today. God's specialty is to take the situation that looks impossible and to make it turn around. You might feel like Jairus, that you are weak, that you can't make a situation come together. Do you know God loves our weakness? He loves to work through our weakness. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I didn't put this in your outline, but this is what God told Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your what? Weakness, yeah. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You want God's power? Here's the, here's the key. Here's the secret right out of the Bible. Just go ahead and admit you're weak. Lord, I can't, we can't do this. Lord, I can't do this. And God goes, I've been waiting for you to say that so I could get busy and take care of the problem. Admit you're weak. Fall at the feet of Jesus, and he will do the miracle that you need. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, today is a day for change. I haven't been living the life that you have for me because I haven't been believing enough for what you want to do in my life. So, Father, I want to claim your promise today that if I ask and I believe, you will do it. Please help me believe instead of being filled with doubt. Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief today. I'm going to reach out like that lady who had been sick for 12 years. I'm going to, I'm going to touch the edge of your cloak right now. I'm going to show you I believe. Please, Lord, let your healing flow into my life this morning like never before. And if you've never committed your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to do that right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's something between you and God. And God knows every thought you have. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can just pray this silently from your heart because he looks on the heart. You can just say this. Actually, you know what? I'd like for all of us to repeat this prayer out loud with me. Would you repeat it just word for word after I say it? Repeat what I've just said. Let's pray it together to support anyone who may be saying this for the first time. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Today I invite you into my heart. Today I step across the line. I will never forget this day. 
the day I became a Christian. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com.